And in Ohio's 11th district, an establishment Democrat clinched a major victory over the progressive candidate, candidate in that primary. Chantel Brown received more than half of Democratic votes. Nina Turner, a former Ohio state senator, came up short with just 44 percent of the vote. And now Brown is the favorite to win in a blue district that includes parts of Cleveland and Akron. I have never lost sight that I do this work for the people. Yeah. That has always been my foundation. That has always been my moral compass. That has always been my guiding force in this work that I intentionally describe as public service because I know I work for you. For more on the race, I want to bring in CBS News political contributor and Democratic strategist Joel Payne and CBS News political contributor and Democratic strategist Antoine Seawright. Um, so first, I have to say that I think I called the candidates candidates. <laughs> I actually meant candidates. Um, but Antoine, let me start with you. It's been a long morning. Uh, what does the outcome of this race tell you? about where the Democratic Party is right now. We just had Congresswoman Cori Bush on our air talking about this very race. Um, and she doesn't think that it's a blow for progressive candidates. Um, but what's your take? Well, first of all, good morning, Vlad, and thank you for having me. Look, uh, congratulations to the Democratic nominee, Chantel Brown, who I know uh, very well and personally. Uh, she will continue the legacy of Lou Stokes. Uh, of Stephanie Tubb Jones uh, and now Secretary Marsha Fudge. Um, this race, uh, Vlad, was decided uh, by uh, local politics. We oftentimes hear that great Tip O'Neill um, philosophy when he says all politics is local, and that's how that race played out. And we cannot forget the impact of the kingmaker, who's now a queenmaker, uh, the majority whip Jim Clyburn. Before his endorsement, Chantel Brown was down 32 points in one poll, 27 points in another. Uh, I think she demonstrated that as a candidate, you have to have a message, you have to be a great messenger, and you have to be able to take a licking and keep on ticking because the money was thrown into the race by outside forces, by progressives, and and others to try to define her as one way and she prevailed. I do not think this means anything from a totality standpoint about the Democratic Party. What it does mean is that Joe Biden is still popular because Chantel Brown's message, as I spent significant time in Cleveland, was all around supporting and being an advocate for the president's agenda and being able to work with the entire Democratic caucus to get something done. And I think we've seen that, seen that play out to be true. The same thing with Troy Carter in the special election to replace the now senior advisor to President um, Biden. Uh, Cedric Richmond. So, Joel, I think it's really interesting what Antoine just said, uh, because, you know, part of the reason we're talking about this race is because people have been watching it to see whether or not it indicates the direction that the Democratic Party is going in. And Antoine just said that Chantel Brown was actually behind until she got some serious muscle from the Congressional Black Caucus. So then I wonder S certain if members of the Congressional that Black support, Caucus. No, okay, so let me finish my question, then either one of you guys can jump in, because I, it makes me wonder if, without that support, whether or not, indeed, her message was really moving people to support her. And perhaps, you know, the progressive message was winning over without some muscle. Yeah, I mean, so I, I, think I, smart. <laughs> I, think, I think Antoine was smart to uh, bring up the point about the legacy of that district, Lou Stokes, Stephanie Tubbs Jones, Marsha Fudge. Chantel Brown is very much in the image of those politicians and Antoine's right to bring up all politics is local. Um, I do think we would be derelict if we didn't mention that Joe Biden is the most popular Democrat in America. And Chantel Brand ran as a Joe Biden Democrat, just like Eric Adams ran in New York as a Joe Biden Democrat. And while I don't think you should make a declarative statement about every Democrat in America having to run this way because all districts are different, all scenarios are different, all campaigns are different, I do think this does give a clear playbook to how to win in this America with Joe Biden at the top of the ticket as a standard bearer of the Democratic Party. Um, special elections are tricky, and we should be careful not to be too deductive about what it means. I know we're going to talk about the uh, the Republican candidate, Mike Carey, in a little bit. We just had a special election in Texas last week where the Trump candidate lost, and now we have a special election where the Trump candidate won. So I wouldn't be too declarative about any outcome that we see in these special elections, but I do think it signals that there's a playbook 
to win with Joe Biden as the kind of guiding light, as the standard bearer of the Democratic Party. So during her concession speech, Nina Turner said evil money was her downfall. I want to play a bit of that. <clears throat> and that is Sister Turner not playing. So, Joel, who is spending evil money? Who is she talking about? <laughs> um, you know, uh, Ms. Turner, and, and look, uh, election night losses are tough. I've been on the other side of a couple of them. You want to blame a lot of things, but let's just look at the facts. She outspent Chantel Brown um, double. I mean, she spent $4.5 million. Chantel Brown spent $2.1 million. There was outside money, but I think Ms. Turner had her own share of outside money backed by a lot of Bernie Sanders supported progressive groups who came in and supported her. Um, I think this is much more a case of not being a good match for her district um, or for the district that she's running for, as opposed to um, the influx of outside money. Both of these candidates were well resourced. In fact, a lot of analysis would say Nina Turner had the financial advantage in the closing weeks because of that influx of Bernie Sanders money. So um, I, I am empathetic to anybody who is standing up giving a concession speech, but I don't believe that's what happened here um, in this race last night. So this is a Democratic stronghold. Chances are, unless something really crazy happens, um, Chantal Brown is going to be heading um, to Washington. So Antoine, what sort of congresswoman is she going to be? Oh, I think she's going to be a heck of a leader. And I don't think she will try to fill the shoes of Marsha Fudge, but I do think she will do her best to create her own footprint. And there's a big lesson from last night's race, and I think this has played out to be true, going back to the presidential primary of 2016 and 2020 uh, and some other special elections. Elections are not won on Twitter and social media. And money is an indicator, but it's not the final indicator. My friend Joe was right. Nina Turner uh, outspent Chantel Brown. Uh, outside groups poured in more money. Uh, most, some people, some some analysts said because she had a rally the weekend before the election with 9,000 people, that was going to translate to her success at the ballot box. When in fact, if you ask the local election commissioners, of that 9,000 people, only maybe 100 or so went across the street and cast a vote early. And we've seen this kind of conversation in the presidential preference primary where we've seen lines wrapped around buildings and people waiting to get in arenas and and people translate that as candidate momentum of success. And that, that was not the case. And so translate that to what Chantel Brown ran on, furthering the agenda of Joe Biden, working with Democrats within the caucus to deliver results for the American people, making sure that her rhetoric and her conversation does not become a liability for her colleagues who are in tougher districts than she may serve. So I think she's going to be a great congresswoman. I do believe the majority whip is going to do his best to bring her in into the leadership fold in some way to make sure she uh, is a quick study and learns the ropes of the Congress so she can be an efficient and effective member of Congress. Um, Joe, you know, when you were mentioning this um, a, a little earlier, I mean, uh, Mike Carey, uh, who's a coal lobbyist um, and was endorsed by former President Donald Trump, um, will win Ohio's 15th congressional district against a non-Trump-backed uh, Republican candidate. Um, but I wonder, when it comes to the one that we're talking about with the Democrats and now this race uh, with uh, Kerry, uh, you know, the political press loves to write these narratives, you know, this is a test of former President Trump's, you know, grip on the Republican Party, or this is a test on the progressives and the Bernie Sanders supporters on the left. And I wonder if it really is. I mean, you know, because we know that a Trump candidate, a Trump back candidate in Texas lost a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I, I, are those narratives helpful to voters trying to decide who to back? 
No, and voters don't follow narratives. Um, narratives follow voters. Um, what I would also say to you is that um, you can go back a couple of cycles when it was President Trump and when Democrats were kind of in the valley um, searching for meaning and purpose. And Connor Lamb, who's going to, you're, you're going to talk to a little bit later, we're going to see him announce for Senate later when he was running for that congressional seat in Pennsylvania, right? He won. People deduced from that that uh, Trump was losing strength. And, and, and I guess my, my point in bringing all of this up is, again, I'm very dubious of making declarations from special elections. I think what we can say about the Republican Party right now in the post-Trump era, or at least the post-Trump presidency era, is that there is a leader of the Trump wing of the Republican Party, and it's Donald Trump. There is not a leader of the non-Trump wing of the Republican Party. So I think that gives an mm. advantage to President Trump to put his finger on the scale. But I would not suggest that this party is wholly owned by Donald Trump. It is wholly influenced by Donald Trump. But there is room for anti-Trump Republicans. And I think it'll be interesting to see that play out over the next 15 months. I want to get Antoine's take on that same question. Well, well I'll say a couple of things. I think Joel is right that Trump, Trump does not have a stronghold on the party, although I think his influence uh, wants to grow and want to be as effective as he was when he was the president. Truth be told, in order for Republicans to have any chance of taking back the majority, particularly in the House, they're going to have to run a, an anti-Trump message because the seats that Democrats currently hold, they won those seats running on an anti-Trump message uh, and pushing back on the failures of Donald Trump. And I don't think you can ignore that. Keep in mind, there will be a redistricting process that take place. And so a lot of these seats will look different uh, come uh, after the fall for, for many Republicans and Democrats. I also think that what we can draw from this special election in particular, and some others, particularly the race down in Louisiana, is that geographics and demographics matter. Uh, if you look at the coalition that got Chantel Brown across the finish line first, it was strong Jewish support. It was a battle fought out in Cleveland, but the race was really won in the suburbs. Uh, and we know what suburbs in this country, what those demographics look like. They're a very mixed bag of voters. I think that was also true in the special election in Louisiana. And so as Democrats, I don't think we can calculate what the next election is going to be based on previous ones, but we can learn a lot about the type of coalitions and the type of voters we're going to have to engage and turn out if we want to have a hint of success in a general election. Now, Chantel Brown will not have a tough election uh, as some other Democrats within the caucus, but I do think she cannot take for granted the demographics and the geographics of those who turned out for her in this primary process. Joel Payne, Antoine Seabright, we haven't spoken to you, uh, gentlemen, in a long time, but really happy to have you here today. Thank you so much.